I'm Anthony Scaramucci, and you're watching The Hole. Welcome to The Hole. I am Rob Sprantz. I'm Lori Levine. We are joined by Miles Taylor. Miles is someone that I've been hoping to have on for quite some time now. He's the uh, former chief of staff for the Department of Homeland Security. That's not that's not a gig anybody can get. <laughs> um, he's uh, you, you, don't, you also Rob don't wear polo shirts when you go to that that, that <laughs> position. So I'm really grateful you guys let me dress down. Oh yeah, one. absolutely. Well, it's funny because I dressed up, Miles, and I put a collared shirt on for you so so we've kind of met in the middle well, Mike, wasn't that a thing that trump made everyone wear a tie and a jacket if we all wore ties the wear the way that donald trump wears ties no one would wear a tie ever again <laughs> donald trump wears a tie like he's in a centerfold photo shoot and it's meant to cover up the unmentionables i mean do you, <laughs> and, and rob i'm totally blowing your introduction but no, do you go, guys go. remember trump at his inauguration of course. No one, I can't forget this. When we saw the image of him walking down the stairs of the Capitol before he emerges on the west front of the Capitol, and he's got this awkward, almost evil swagger and this red tie that's tied six inches too long below his belt line. Any man whose dad has taught him to tie a tie knows that's not how you do it. But it was just so weird. I'll never get that out of my head. And, and when we saw the inauguration this past week, uh, watching Joe Biden walk with such dignity with his wife was such a refreshing reset. So with a, with anyway, a regular tie, with a regular tie, dressed like a know, real man. Did you see Chris Christie said that he's like Donald Trump told me to wear a really long tie because I'll look thinner. <laughs> it doesn't work. Well, <laughs> I, just, I, I don't even think I should comment. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it does not work. But you know, the analogy is fine when you said lumbering with that tie. It's like an elephant with a trunk just kind of swinging back and forth, you know? Uh, and it was. And he had this just gaze. I mean, listeners and viewers have got to go back and YouTube that video. The gaze in that moment said everything about the next four years that you needed to see is a guy who was assuming that office with total irreverence that he was going to lay waste to the institutions that were his responsibility. And it was all contained in that moment. I mean, it was so cinematic. I mean, I guess it was fitting that a, that a TV guy would know how to be a TV villain in real time. But yeah. anyway, we digress. No, it's fine. You know, it's I um, I like in the one of the moments that had me on the TV villain thing, he didn't even play a part of. I think the first time I got incredibly concerned was the initial, even though it was, uh, you know, benign in, in the topic, the initial Sean Spicer press conference where he came out and literally screamed at the press room about the inauguration, not even being prodded. Um, and I was watching, I remember watching that getting a little chill, like what, what just happened? You know, like how, why did this guy just come out and scream at the press corps? And clearly he was directed by it. And I know, yeah. you know, and, and so, so let me kind of just get back for a second, just so the, the people who don't know, um, who Miles is can get a, a better sense of that. So Miles was, you know, acting chief of staff for the Department of Homeland Security during the Trump administration. And, you know, before you start jumping to conclusions, he's a Republican. He at least he was at the time. He worked for the Bush administration, too. He interned for Dick Cheney. So this is not someone, you know, who's a, you know, total left wing that just went in there to sabotage anything at all. You know, he he went in there with the best intentions. And um, you had, you know, the word patriot gets thrown around a lot these days and sometimes it gets thrown around for the wrong reasons and that is it gets thrown around and like you know if you're not showing blind loyalty you're the patriot you know if you're showing blind loyalty if you if you accept everything that happens you're the patriot um so if it, i'm sure a lot of people remember there was a moment uh where an op-ed came out uh about someone being on the inside who was part of the resistance and I remember the day that this article hit because we were all very concerned daily about what was going on. And I remember reading the article and thinking, wow, someone, I guess they're, we're not the only ones that are seeing it. 
So the article itself um, later had come to be from Miles, and Miles, you know, came out, and we're gonna. I want to get to all of that, how that process happened, and everything about. Oh, remember, it. Rob, we thought that it was Mike Pence, maybe. We yeah, there was so many guesses. Did you? So all right, you know what? It's, while we're on it, let's jump to that first because I'm I'm fascinated with how that process works because you know you only see it in in Hollywood and Oliver Stone movies where you meet a guy in a park bench and you hand him a thumb drive and you sneak away and you know you're both in trench coats and all of this. <laughs> so it's I'm sure it's nothing like that. But what made you decide to write this first of all? Um, I mean, you must have been seeing some things because, you, you know, that's you're exposing yourself and putting yourself in, in danger by doing something like that. Yeah. I mean, you know, well, Rob, straight in, no kissing. Fantastic. Thanks. <laughs> but, and, and, and I don't want to be I don't want to be flip about it, because honestly, um, that came on the heels of a really terrible summer. It was it came out in September of 2018 is when I published the op-ed and not under my own name. And we can talk about why I did it that way in a minute, but I want to talk about the context of that period. I was at the time working as the deputy chief of staff at Department of Homeland Security very soon after became the chief of staff and had witnessed a really horrible experience. And that was, and all of your listeners probably are very well aware of one of the worst decisions that happened during the Trump administration, which is, the decisions on immigration that resulted in family separation, mm -hmm. children separated from their parents at the border, a gut-wrenching, very disgusting humanitarian disaster. And I just witnessed that whole thing and watched as kind of a backbencher, the slow motion train wreck that happened as the administration rushed into making a choice that anyone with rational thought could have seen ahead of time was gonna be a disaster and did it anyway, and then it was a disaster. And, but after that period, I thought, look, everyone's gotta resign. We gotta call out how horrible this guy is and this administration is, but to my sort of surprise and discomfort, there was even more horrible things on the horizon that the president wanted to do, including, this'll get you, like three weeks after the president ended the zero tolerance family separation debacle, he was saying to the Secretary of Homeland Security, he wanted to restart it and make it bigger and more draconian. So wow. you can't imagine being there and saying, this is sick, we've got to stop it, we can't do this. And then the president's like, and, and thinking we got to resign and call him out. And then he's like, and by the way, I want to do it again. And you're like, oh shit, we have to literally stay because the people he'll put in our place are ready to just say yes and rubber stamp anything. So anyway, that's the context. A lot of bad things were happening and a lot of bad things were on the horizon. And so I put out a piece, I reached out to the New York Times. You know, this is the moment that it happened, the proximate cause, the, the piece of hay on the camel's back, Rob, was I, was I flew out to Australia to go meet with our top intelligence partners to talk about some sensitive stuff. I get there, I'm sleeping, it's in the middle of the night. And I get woken up by a phone call from the White House. And John McCain's just passed away like 12 hours before, maybe 24 hours before. And they say, the president's pissed <laughs> because the flags have been lowered across the country for John McCain. And he hated John McCain. And the president wanted the flags raised back up. Why does that have to do with me? Well, because my department, DHS, we tell all federal buildings when to raise and lower the flags for national events. And so they said, you know, the president's furious, you know, what do we do? And I responded, I said, basically over the course of, this is a summation, but over the course of a couple hours in the middle of the night, I said, you know, if you guys want us to raise the flags back up, we're gonna have to get a direct order from the president himself. And he's also probably gonna get resignation letters if he does that. Yeah. Like we respect John McCain's service. And it was that moment that I popped up at, at that point it was about 4.45 in the morning. And I said, that's it, enough of this shit. Like I need to say to people, that one, the president's cabinet thinks he's crazy. They understand, they get it, right? They think he's crazy. Two, they're trying really hard to contain the crazy. And three, it's on all Americans to realize that we're in this together. And so I put out that message. I was wrong in a big way about one thing though. I was really wrong about this idea that the people around the president could serve as guardrails against him. I was dead wrong about that. 
And that's something that I later went on to admit is to say, I thought the people around him could serve as guardrails. They didn't because the president was going to do what he wanted to do. And he systematically dismantled those guardrails. So anyway, that's the that's the long version. I try to give you the short version. No, no. The, the long version is the one we want. Um, so you you decide to write this now do you do you write it ahead of time do you already have press contacts that you no. know you can trust i mean does, how where does that connection come where you 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 find someone that's willing to not only publish it but you know protect you as a source do you start yeah. looking looking for someone to speak to um i got to imagine no one around you knew you were doing it either it's a great question that's, that's actually one i don't think i've answered in many, many interviews and conversations. And, and the answer is this. I, um, I obviously, for spending a career in national security, most of my career has not been in politics. I don't do campaigns. I am a Republican, uh, but, but mostly I've been animated by, you know, the September 11th terrorist attacks changed my life, maybe want to go into public service, national security, protect the country, protect my fellow citizens. Most of that exists irrespective of politics. Um, but in the course of doing those things, working on Capitol Hill and in the White House, met a lot of reporters. But uh, I'm just going to cut straight to the chase, Rob and Lori. The reason why I published that op-ed in the New York Times was because Donald Trump hated the New York Times. And he <laughs> turned them into a symbol of the free press when he said they were enemies of the free press. Weeks before I did it, he said the New York Times was enemies of the free press uh, because they reported an accurate story about him. And so I thought there's no better place to punish him than in the pages of the paper he resents for telling the truth. Because truth is so important here. Truth is what's going to get us past the Trump administration, the damage of it. And truth uh, is the thing that Donald Trump fought every single day against. So there was so much symbolism for me personally in going to the Times. And I had a contact there who I knew really well, who's very well respected, who put me in touch with their editorial page. I won't reveal any of those people because it was a really sensitive process. But I, I wrote the thing. I had nothing pre-planned. But after the John McCain thing, I woke up so furious I wrote it, almost what you read in that New York Times op-ed is what I wrote in real time. We made very, very few edits. I mean, maybe five words, very few edits. And, uh, and they published it rapidly after the fact. And, um, and I gotta say, they, it's an incredible paper and they're great people. I almost feel like I'm Trump saying that. It's an incredible paper. <laughs> it's the greatest, greatest paper people. of all time. You've never seen their <laughs> Beautiful paper. But they, but they were because they, they knew I wasn't just putting my career on the line. I would have gotten fired in a heartbeat the second it came out or my life on the line. Clearly I would have been trashed by the president, but my actual life on the line, because by then we knew we were in an environment where if you criticized the president, you received physical threats of violence against your family members and your sisters and brothers and mothers and fathers and children. And so they knew that and I trusted them implicitly. And you know what, the New York Times was brilliant in that process. And I, I didn't even tell my spouse at the time mm -hmm. that I was the author of it because I wanted to protect everyone that much that no one would know to tell. So um, I, I give them great credit for that. And um, they did a good job of keeping it very secretive and, and following all the procedures they needed to do to do that. In fact, I think we ended up with only before you publish an op-ed in a paper like that, you have to sign, you still have to sign a, a disclaimer to them and there's copyright stuff and whatever else. And I signed the document and they kept one physical copy in a safe in New York that only one or two people had access to because they were that assiduous uh, about their job. So I, I give them credit. They're just extraordinary journalists over there. Yeah, what was that... the environment like when you go to work the day after that publishes? Uh, another question that I haven't been asked publicly, Lori, um, I'll tell you where I was. I, I want to I, I bring the listener in because when I was when I was working at Department of Homeland Security, right, my boss is the secretary, first John Kelly, then we had an acting secretary, then Kirsten Nielsen, then Kevin McAleen, and uh, I think there's been six secretaries of Homeland Security under the Trump administration. That should tell you all you need to know in four years about that place. But we have a an office that's a swing space close to the White House. Most departments and agencies are far from the White House. Um, but, but we're lucky in that we had a, a place close by, so when you had a lot of meetings there, you could be near there. And at the time, we were down at the what was called the Ronald Reagan building that day. 
and close by the White House, a lot of meetings, and the secretary was getting ready to go to a meeting with the president in the Oval Office and uh, had just taken off. And I retreated to my office and sat down and I didn't know when it was going to drop. Um, I thought it was actually maybe going to be the next day and my phone buzzed and I had an alert and the alert said, you know, anonymous whistleblower or something, something from the New York times drops op-ed. And I actually, just in that moment, I thought, Oh shit. That's it's right. happening sooner than I thought. I sort of thought I was going to be at home. So if we had to pack up and leave, you know, we'd be able to. And, and really my immediate thoughts weren't about the reaction or reception or anything. It was really just the it's physical family. security against the people I cared about is to watch and see whether and how quickly the name, and I had zero confidence that the name would be held. So I thought, okay, it's going to break any moment and I'll have to just drop everything, rush downstairs, get to my car, call everyone and say, you know, this is what you need to do. I thought a lot about what to say, what to tell those people. And then that didn't happen and didn't happen and didn't happen. But it's kind of one of those things where the adrenaline is pumping so much over so many days that you realize you could almost be a late night advertisement for a B12 <laughs> complex vitamin or B complex vitamin because your body's just churning through it. Um, so it was, uh, it was stressful, but it was just a long tail of stress that petered out. And I'll tell you the point that was like so, sort of stunning there is in the process uh, you know, we, we were very close to the White House Chief of Staff and Deputy Chief of Staff's office, and I got a phone call the next day of the person. Who was the person. chief of staff? Was that John Kelly John, at that time? John Kelly was the chief of staff, and, and I won't say who the person that called me was, but someone senior from the White House called me and said, hey, you know, how you doing? They wanted to talk about something else. And I said, how are you guys doing? They said, oh, you know, the president's furious. He's trying to hunt down who the author of this anonymous op-ed is. And I said, ah, oh, well, it has that going. And this person was, the, the you know, kind of the leader of the hunt. And I said, what, what are you guys turning up? And the person said, honestly, <laughs> this is the fucking <laughs> stupidest thing that we could do. Like everyone knows that everyone feels this way. So we're just not going to do it. And we're going to just tell him there are too many leads. Yeah. And I thought, and I mean, this till, still to this day, this person doesn't know. In fact, as I think about it, as we're talking, I could, I could tell this person, I could repeat this conversation to them. They probably remember. But um, I was like, I had a sense of relief. But at the same time, almost a, a disappointment because a piece of you, when you're in that stressful situation, almost wants to be called out and just ejected from that hell. But um, but there was still more work to be done. Um, I'm picturing I Miles with like a bag of a hundred thousand dollars in small bills next to him. <laughs> it's like six passports. <laughs> that's right i mean we we could all could have all used a couple of passports probably still could <laughs> but you know it's it's funny that you mentioned like the the nerves that must have hit because another thing about this administration has always been when something does get out and it gets out frequently when something does get out their deflection to the facts of it is to go after who's the one who leaked it, who's the traitor who leaked it. So the fact that their tactic is to find who it is kind of adds to the stress already. You know, I got to imagine that, that you know, that everybody knows that cold chill your body gets when you get nervous. That had to be what you felt when that phone buzzed for the first time. And, you know, I'm sure you had people coming up to you that you worked right next to saying, can you believe this? Did you read this? Did you? I mean, and you're just yeah. kind of trying to. So, play so many people, I mean, so many people, my own, you know, my own partner at the time, you know, was someone who was like, who do you think it was? You know, and you have to kind of just, aimlessly speculate without throwing the speculation on someone in particular. I do regret deeply. There were people who were suspected of writing it that weren't just Pence. There were others who kind of suffered from the accusation. In fact, there was one person in particular that was so readily accused of being the author that I told my agents, you know, you guys, we, we said we weren't going to deny it or confirm anything but we got to deny this one because this woman and her family are, are suffering and they did. And they, they also had the same thought at the same time as they were like, we got to deny this because she's getting too much heat. I was glad that they did that. But other than that, yeah, I mean, I, I you know, I had to, and look, people can, uh, you know, there's plenty of people out there who, who are suspicious of my motives or think there was a, a wider aim 
Um, I got to be honest with you. I'm a Midwestern kid from small town, LaPorte, Indiana, that grew up, wanted to do national security, cared about government, wasn't super political. And but really, at the end of the day, just saw what everyone else saw. I'm not really special in that equation. What's the only thing that's special isn't me. What's special is that so many important people saw that such a powerful man had lacked so much character and was doing so many bad things and they didn't want to talk about it. So a nobody who the hell is Miles Taylor? Really? Who the hell is that guy has to go and broadcast it because they won't speak up. That's the takeaway here, folks. Mm -hmm. And, and for those that would say, well, you're a spineless little twerp because you were scared to expose your own name, course correction. Because what I felt very strongly about was that I would explain what was happening anonymously so that Trump couldn't attack me personally, because that's his favorite thing to do, Rob. You're absolutely right. The politics of personal destruction, and he doesn't debate ideas. So I wanted to put something out to deprive him of those politics of personal destruction. So he had to debate the ideas. Guess what he didn't do? Trump never challenged what I said anonymously in the op-ed or later in the book that I wrote. He didn't. He couldn't because he couldn't contend with ideas. He doesn't know policy. I could go one-on-one -on -one with him right now on your show and eviscerate him on policy. He couldn't do it. And so those arguments stood. But what I also felt very passionately about is that I, as a person, had to expose my own identity and position in the government while he was still president while it was very personally detrimental to me and could literally put my life in danger in order to make sure that it had credibility. And so that's what I did. I could have waited as people wanted me to do in my immediate orbit until the safety of a Biden administration to say, hey, here's who I was. Ha ha. Let, like, let me go strike a great book deal and make money. And that's wrong. And I didn't want to do that. And and look, I'll, I'll be very frank with you guys, and we'll skip ahead in the conversation to the, when I exposed that, it ripped my life into pieces, in half. And I knew that that was a possibility, but I felt like it was so important that I not do it for the wrong reasons, for money or for attention. I had to do it to get that man out of office. And that's why I did it in the timing that I did it. And some people will, you know, not like that or debate it or think there was a better way to go. Maybe there was, but if it in any way helped keep Donald Trump from a second term, I would do it a thousand times over. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know, we appreciate that. I know that we do. And a lot of people do. And you know, you wrote um, a full book called the warning, um, which you've of course now uh, owned up to it. And I do commend you on doing that. Uh, while Trump was still in office. And, you know, what, what a lot of people don't realize is, you know, Miles agreed to come on the show quite some time ago and had to, you know, and, and all of a sudden we got a cancellation. And I was like, oh, that's a bummer. And then saw an article the next day that he went into hiding. You're still to this day the only guest that we've had that went into hiding. So, so, <laughs> the only I, think one the, I think the artwork in the background somehow is going to identify me. <laughs> These people are going to look at, they're going to try to figure out who is this woman and where does she live? <laughs> well, well she I was here. No, uh, I was expecting uh, you in like one of those Saddam beards in a cave when you came back, came back on. But when, well, like, see, the problem is, Rob, I, when I grow a beard, it grows really dark below and it grows really blonde <laughs> right here. So it looks like I'm wearing a chin strap and my head is the helmet. So I can't, I can't grow, I can't grow a good beard, but, but no, I mean, look, I, and I don't say this to have any listener play the violin for me because no one needs to. I'm OK. But what they need to know about my story, why I need to be the pinata about public service is that in this environment with Donald Trump, we have so villainized public servants or at least half the country or a large portion of the country has villainized public servants who disagree with the president and who try to just tell the objective truth, that it puts their lives in danger. And during this campaign, there's, there's nothing I'm more proud of in my life than in the campaign against Donald Trump after I came out, after I couldn't get a lot of the top names around Trump to come out against him because they were worried about the same things as me, their homes, their lives, their families, their futures, their jobs. They were worried about all those things, all the things that I had subsequently lost because of coming out against him. 
I recruited a, a bunch of my peers to come out and speak out against him. And great people have done that. Olivia Troy, Elizabeth Newman, John Mitnick, Josh Venable, you can go on and on. These are people who were at my level in the administration who knew the same things their bosses knew, spoke out against him. They uh, experienced extraordinary, terrible things. Alexander Vindman, Fiona Hill, um, a lot of threats against their families, against their lives. In my case, yes. I mean, the, the day that I revealed that I was anonymous, Rob, I got a call from uh, friends in the Secret Service and they said, you need to get protection now. Wow. And I was in another city deliberately at the time. I wasn't in Washington, D.C. And I went to bed that night with a gun under my pillow with one chamber in the round because I thought there was a possibility that someone, because of that revelation, would pop in, try to kill me. And, you know, that's what you got to do for your family. So, again, you know, for a you know, period of time, I've had to have 24-7, you know, personal security detail, had to shuttle between locations. Um, not because I'm afraid to own up to it. I, I'll own up to all of it. But because, you know, they'll go after anyone and everyone who opposes this cult leader who is Donald Trump. That is what people need to take away from this is our, uh, our political arena has devolved to the place where public servants are derided to the point of death for speaking the truth about what they see. And that's happened to so many of my former colleagues and it's what we've got to work against. It's what we've got to get beyond. Uh, and hopefully Joe Biden and this administration, even though they're Democrats, I'm a Republican, I'm going to oppose a lot of things they do, but hopefully they can put that behind us. And Joe Biden's unity inaugural address, it was, the theme was unity. I think uh, is a, a good starting point to doing just that. Yeah, and I, I get a sense of what you mean on a, such a smaller scale because, you know, we've had uh, Rick Wilson from the Lincoln Project on. We've had Anthony Scaramucci. We had uh, Noel Kassler on who um, was worked uh, on The Apprentice and he told a bunch of stories. And the comments that I get or the direct messages I get are sometimes riddled with just insults but once yeah. in a while, it says you will die, your families will die. Like, you know, and it's weird. In a, in a way, I'm detached from it because it's the internet, click, 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 and, and whatever it is. But then you see things that happen at the Capitol, and you go, "Wow!" You know, there, yes. all it takes is one. There, there's not, it's there's not just one lunatic. They're they're trying to you know kidnap a, a governor. I mean, this is not. And the election, uh, the Georgia election board, what they those guys have endured. Right. With yes. this. And, and it's Dominion voting systems. My good friend Christopher Krebs, who was the nation's top election security official. I mean, these people have endured real threat. I mean, Chris, he's got five kids, you know, and I, I'm lucky, I, you know, in the sense that I, I don't have kids that I have to protect right now. But, you know, people like that have got to literally worry about their little people being assaulted, kidnapped, or killed because they went out and just said the truth, in that case, that the election was safe and secure and valid. That shouldn't be a reason in the freest country on the face of the planet to be threatened with death from your peers. That is yeah. stunning. And Rob, you like so effectively, I think, hit the nail on the head with that, is it, uh, it spiraled. And the insurrection, though, was in a way, even though it spiraled, it should have been the very predictable result of all of this, is that the rejection of objective truth was going to result in a huge swath of the country believing something had been taken, stolen from them to the point that they would you know, go and, and, and break into the citadel of democracy and deface it. Yeah. It's, it, it's very scary to see that. It's almost when, you know, when those people uh, that hide on the internet all of a sudden are embodied and you see them right in front of you. There's this chilling uh, video that I saw, one of the clips, which kind of g can explain to anyone if you're not, if you don't have an idea of what Miles would have been afraid of, if not listening to this doesn't already give you that sense. There's a, there's a video on social media of this woman is standing near the Capitol 
And she's singing over and over again, wash in the blood of Jesus over and over again. And then the camera pans to the Capitol and you see smoke and screaming and you're hearing, you know, flashbangs and, and all of this stuff. And she's just it's it's a it's a level of um, disconnect with reality that you can't even comprehend. Um, and, but, you know, it, it's it's scary. Let, let me give you, Rob, if you'll indulge me, I'm going to give you a sense. I'm stepping away from the camera. I'm going to give you a sense of what this is like. I just, I literally want your viewers to have a palpable understanding of what happens here. So as that, as the, as the insurrection is happening at the Capitol, I am actually out of town that day. And you hear me rifling through my backpack for something that's going to be a part of my story here. I'm out of town that day. Uh, for part of it, because I was having my car sweeped because we had, we had reasons to believe that someone might have bugged my vehicle and put, put a, you know, a tracking device on it. And so I was having the security firm do a sweep of the vehicle. And as I'm coming back into town and the insurrection is happening, one of my first thoughts is, look, there's me and a handful of other people who are Trump dissidents who are on these target lists on these websites that are like, kill these people. Right. But, and I've got my concealed carry license, you know, I've got my firearm that, like I said, the night that I came out as an anonymous, I went to bed with it under my pillow, but I couldn't have it with me in certain places that I was traveling in the district because there's a lot of restrictions in DC around the National Mall and the Capitol where you can have a weapon and where you can't. And uh, the head of my security detail at the time had said to me uh, early on, you're going to need to, especially in D.C., have a number of things on you that are legal, that aren't your firearm to protect yourself if something goes wrong. And one of those was he said, I want you to have this. And I said, this is a that's a ballpoint pen. What am I going to do with a ballpoint pen? And Rob and Lori, what he said was, well, it's not, it's carbon fiber. I was like, okay, well, it's a strong ballpoint pen, but what am I going to do with that, with that to defend myself? And for those oh, who are looking wow. on video, it's a, a carbon fiber, very, very sharpened ballpoint pen. And not just that, it's hollowed out. It's hollowed out. Yeah. And so what does that mean? That means if you're, in mortal fear of your life and a bad guy comes up and you close the hollow point and you have to hit him somewhere, he's got two choices. One is to throw you off and you let go and he bleeds out and dies. And the other is to hold you there and he's got a choice to live. That is one of the craziest freaking things that I've ever had to be told is this might save your life. I don't think like that on a daily basis. I literally think about policy and speeches and counterterrorism and whatever. Um, But this is the environment that we live in, is that public servants have to be told, yeah, you don't have your gun. People are going to try to kill you. Here's a pen, a special pen to save your life. I don't care if you're a Democrat or Republican. That's really, really screwed up that that's where we've gotten. And this is also the point in your podcast where viewers are saying, uh, I thought this was a comedy. Hell not. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, 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 no. This, so there's that. that. There's that too. No, that's great. Are you kidding me? I, I, I love getting into this stuff and I know Lori does too. Like it's um, all of this. It's real. I mean, it's real. This it's, is real life. This is real I'm life. Love, this is can real I life. ask People, yeah. you have an extraordinary background, a Marshall scholar, which I didn't even know what it was until I researched you. Uh, you a same. In, I mean, except before, you know, I didn't know what it was until someone was like, here's a free way to go to grad school. I was like, I will look that up. <laughs> and then interning with Dick Cheney, working for George W. I mean, you could have went into the, and I know you've been asked this a million times, you could have went into the private sector and made a ton of money. Why did you go and work for Donald Trump? It's a great question. Honestly, it's a very simple answer. I had so many friends uh, at the time who asked that. Um, John Kelly was really a symbol for me, and I won't wax poetic about him anymore because I did earlier. He's one of the greatest bosses I ever had. But um, 
four-star general who just didn't have to go in, but people like that and Jim Mattis and others who could have easily served in a Democratic administration went in. And I had friends who said, why would you go in? This man is crazy. And my answer was really simple. It was, I'm going in because this man is crazy. Right, right. And and if not us, then it's going to be an island of misfit toys that come in, you know, advisors from the campaign to do these jobs, these really important jobs that require people who know what they're doing. Um, you know, to Trump, DHS was all about immigration, which was really sad because to the rest of us, DHS was built to prevent an, another 9-11 from terrorists, cybersecurity threats, election I mean, security threats. the department threats was started Russia. after 9-11, right? Yeah, FEMA, natural disasters, the whole thing, economic security, you know, threats from China, across the board, so many other things that Donald Trump never understood, even when we told him about those. And um, so that was my answer, is like, look, I'm, I'm going in very much recognizing not having voted for him, that he's crazy. And uh, and so I did, and and that turned out to be worse than I ever imagined. And then you would get the question, well, then why stay? And the answer is, I'm why stay? He's, uh, he's doing immoral things. The answer is, I'm staying because he's doing immoral things. The really important question is, why does someone like me leave? And you leave at the point at which saying no is no longer enough. So you stay as long as you can say no and stop bad stuff. But the point at which the president starts starts saying, well, you said no, but I say yes, is when you go, I got to get out because I'm doing more harm than good by being in. And that's pretty much precisely the moment that I left. Yeah, the, you know, you mentioned a little earlier about the guardrails and that, you know, we hope that the guardrails would would stay. And, you know, reading the um, reading the op ed gave me a moment of calm, but the guardrails didn't stay because the guardrails were, you know, he had the screwdriver to remove them. So, you know, I think. Um, I'm sure General Kelly was a bit of a guardrail because for a couple of months, things really did seem to settle down and, and it seemed to, to take a more even keel. But then once he left, I think is really when things started going crazy because it started to become, he started to realize that, okay, if this person doesn't agree with me, I'll just fire him, put in someone that has absolutely no experience whatsoever and they'll just do what I say. And, you know, it happened with, uh, you know, and not that uh, William Barr didn't have experience, but, you know, to, to bring in William Barr, I'm sh I have no doubt there was a conversation with him and Barr saying, I got to bring you in to protect me on this and to help me on this, when that should never, ever be the point of the Justice Department. You know, Biden says it often, the Justice Department works for you. They don't work for me. He makes it a point to say that often because I think He's trying to correct the distrust that so many people have in the system, you know, that that he's put together. But what I we haven't touched on, and I really want to kind of almost roll it back a little bit is the first time you're in a meeting with him and the first time mm. you that. Oh, my God moment where you realize that he is what you thought he was and he is the focus is not there and that, oh, my God, this person isn't just like that on television. Like, because, you know, we all have this in our minds when he won. I had this thought in my head, OK, he it was what it was for the campaign. But any human with any kind of self-awareness, when their head hits the pillow the night they win the presidency, thinks, I'm the president of the United States. This is, I need to take this seriously. I need to, you know, be what this office asks of me. And instead, it was the opposite. It's, I'm the president of the United States because they, because of who I was. And, you know, it, it seemed like he, he just exploded that, the negative parts of the persona um, to, to a crazy degree. 
Um, but in the book, um, you do you speak a lot about how he was in meetings, and and that's when really you started, even before the John McCain moment, where you was, you started to realize we might be in some serious trouble. Like, how did the, how did those first meetings go? Yeah, it, that's that's a great question, Rob. I think the only thing you left out was the he falls asleep on the my pillow trademark my pillow <laughs> at night and that's that's what ends up happening i regret to say that i'm a i'm a consumer of my pillow i actually think it's kind of comfortable i'm not paid to promote it and i'm disappointed <laughs> that the founder is a big trump supporter because i kind of like that lumpy pillow that they produce but that's neither here nor there the 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 first real moment for me and i i, I allude to this in the book and really Largely, the book, my goal was not to write a tell-all. My goal was to not do what people do in Washington is, you know, just just spew everything. It was a character indictment of the president himself. And as a, as a result, it lacks a lot of the details I could have provided, partly because I had to protect my identity until I came out under my own name, and partly because I didn't want it to be about the people around him who also fucked up, of which there are many. Um, so I, uh, I, I wrote it sort of vaguely, but uh, there's anecdotes in there. And, and one of them that I allude to that has more, a uh, more specific timeline is early in the administration, we went to brief the president on something kind of a sensitive national security issue to a point and we briefed him and we had kind of five or six or seven things that we really needed to get his decision on in order to move forward. And we recognized in the course of the conversation, it was an unmitigated disaster because without, without visuals or pictures or anything, we couldn't really get him to hone in on those five or seven things. We couldn't get him to hone in on one thing. He was so distracted. And it was a terrible lesson learned that in the future, when we went back into the Oval Office for meetings with the president, we literally, this isn't meant to be facetious, we would go in with one page or pictures of the thing we were talking about. It would be better if it didn't have words oh than God. if it had words to try to say, here's what we're talking about. So the president could focus on it, but it wasn't five or seven things. You couldn't do five or seven pictures. You would just have to decide what's the number one most important thing in this meeting and can our graphics people capture that in time for the conversation. That is not just problematic in an office place. That's severe office place dysfunction. And we're not just talking about an office place. We're talking about the most important office place mm -hmm. in the world. Right. And, and we're talking about a security done. briefing, a homeland security right. briefing. We're talking, yeah, we're, about. We're, talking about, we're talking about lives being on the line. There right. were conversations we had with the president in the White House Situation Room that I can't talk about, but that he would become so distracted in the course of that he would say things like, there was a conversation where we were talking about a very serious issue that ties to the security of our elections. And the president said, you wouldn't believe if you saw the map, how many counties I won in the United States. And he went on a harangue about how red the map was with his victories from 2016. It was incredibly irrelevant to the conversation, but more importantly, distracted from the fact that we were trying to tell him that our democratic process was in danger. He didn't care. He just wanted to talk about how he won, how he won so big, and how he was going to win so big again. The guy couldn't focus on doing the job. And I don't know how you can witness that and not at least want to do what I did. I'm not tooting my horn, but that was my frustration with other people in the administration is that they saw this same shit and they were like, that's horrible, but I've got to look out for my resume or for my own. No, 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 no. It was incumbent upon us after saying no, no longer did enough to stop him to literally go out there and talk about what we were seeing. That's incumbent upon any public servant. And, and I, I, I feel very grateful that we are now entering an era, even if I disagree with Joe Biden on a lot of things, we're entering a time period where I don't think a lot of Biden appointees are going to have to come out and blow the whistle. Right. Let's I love so. in the book how you said in other meetings, you would see Donald Trump pull out that election map and just show people. Well, 
it made no sense in the meeting. Yeah. It and, was and totally out of context. It's listeners, like you're talking to- listeners and viewers who are looking for it, I think you can Google Donald Trump election map, and there's this one that shows every county in America, and it's like a sea of red. <laughs> yeah. oh, he loved it. It was like his favorite picture he's ever seen. Yeah. Because land doesn't vote, but that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> yeah, but, right. And you know, and and he and you know, the president, you know, had come out and said very clearly that he did not know you. You know, here's a photo of him not knowing you. Uh, yeah. uh, of ever. There's, so many, there's <laughs> many more I didn't release, Rob. Yeah, I mean, you know, um, but you know that that's scary, and and that you know, I can see why from your department why someone you know as yourself would be the person to come out because okay maybe for treasury they sit in a meeting and you know he goes on a tangent or never pays attention to anything and then walk out and go well you know financially we're in trouble but homeland security you know and the reason i mean 9 11 is the reason you got into this and now you're trying to warn him about threats uh, to security, election security, whatever it may be, and he is literally not paying attention and, and and talking about it. And it's it's all the things that you hear or you expect. Um, you know, there's all the jokes, the executive time, and all of the stuff that doesn't really do anything, and the golf and all of the stuff. But you know, if if he played golf all the time, but at the same time when it came down to serious matters, he was serious, or you could tell he was focused. That's another story. But anybody who's seen any of the rallies, who who sees the second, it's always the most entertaining part, but the second he looks away from the teleprompter or starts to try to color it, you see the real person. And that's when you see that the the ADD, the, the you know, whatever, the, whatever it one is that's going on. One of my favorite parts of Miles' book is how it says, like, before one of his rallies, the Oval Office, like a pep rally, everyone's excited. Like, it's, right, Miles, like, you're, you're gearing up for this and yeah, not I mean, you they're trying to hype him up for it, right and that's as we got to the point where like the sycophants overtook the adults is it was like you know the locker room before the big game which is just not how democracy would be i mean like i'll give you an example that for me was an omen of what was to come with COVID 19 and that was we had we had deadly hurricanes bearing down on the east coast and we were in the Oval Office with the president, and I was explaining to him on a chart where the the hurricane was headed and where it was oh, going to Alabama. Hit landfall. Yeah, well, no, it was before that one. Oh. Is uh, it was I think it was Hurricane Florence. It was getting ready to hit the Carolinas, and we're explaining it to him. And I was surprised. It was the first Oval Office meeting I've been in with him where he was just silent and following along and not interrupting. I was like, well, this is great. He's digesting it, and he's going to go out and warn the people about how dangerous this is. And I'm pointing it with the deputy administrator of FEMA to the hurricane as it's coming in. The president's looking really perplexed at the graphic. And I've told the story before, but he, uh, he then said, uh, I, uh, you know, I've got a question. We stopped. Yeah. What is it, Mr. President? Is that the, uh, is that the direction that hurricanes always spin? Oh my God. Are you serious? <laughs> clockwise? He, he wanted to know cause he saw the arms of the hurricane. Do they always spin counterclockwise? Well, yes, it's called the Coriolis effect. You've heard people say, you know, toilets flush a different direction in Australia. That's It has to do with gravity and the earth, et cetera. But that's what the president was focused on, not where it was going to hit, loss of life, et cetera. Just like, do they always spin that way? And he was like, that's amazing. That's so amazing. Always, every time. So you had to explain to him, like, fifth grade earth science. And then after that, he was like, you know, he just goes off on tangents. He's like, you know, I saw on television a guy with a MAGA hat in a grocery parking lot, and he said, you know, he's going to hunker down, and that's what MAGA supporters do. They hunker down, and they're tough. And to her credit at the time, Sarah Sanders jumped in and said, Mr. President, I don't think you should say that when you're at the microphones in a few minutes um, because – and what she could have said is because a lot of people could die, and he wouldn't have cared. But what she said was – Mr. President, you shouldn't say that people should hunker down because if all those MAGA supporters in the parking lot hunker down, you might lose North or South Carolina in your reelection, and you need both of them to right. win. He said, you know what, Sarah, that's so smart. We should tell the people they need to evacuate. Like, wow. that's what we're talking about. I mean, I, I would leave meetings like that and say, this is life or death. And I say it's an omen for COVID-19 because in the book, Lori, I write, at the time, this was, of course, now almost two years ago, I said, thank God. 
we haven't had an international crisis under Donald Trump, a major international crisis, warfare or a pandemic, mm. because he would be incapable of handling it, right? It would result in extraordinary loss of life. And of course, after I wrote that, we saw the greatest pandemic in a century. And, and naturally, his inability to divorce his own personal self-image from the event. Mm. And as a result, it became an egotistical response that saved only one person in his own mind, and that was Donald Trump, and sacrificed now 400,000 lives for his own personal vanity. That's how severe a lot of us thought it was and could be. And I, I, and I had hoped that we would never confront that before the end of his administration, but we did. I've lost a family member to COVID-19, and I seriously, seriously believe, I will tell you, I believe to my core, that if it weren't for Donald Trump as president, I would literally, I would have that family member today. Like I, I would have a family member who wasn't dead if it wasn't for this man. I don't know how politics could get more personal than that. And our goal should be to make politics vastly more impersonal than that, that we can trust the Bidens, the Trumps, the Bushes, whoever's in office to just do right by us and protect us. But unfortunately in those four years, we could not. Well, even the smallest thing to politicizing wearing a mask, like just wear a mask. Mm -hmm. Just wear a mask. I mean, if you're listening right now, put it on, you know, just, just practice. It kind of feels good. <laughs> it kind of feels nice. I'm not going to lie to you. When you're, when you're on the run, I'm going to go get more props. When you're, especially if you're on the run, especially if people are trying to find out, you know, who you are and where you're at. Well, I was going to have a mask that says anonymous. Yeah, and they're, yeah. they're trying to kill you. When they're trying to kill you, I'm telling you, there's nothing better than putting on a mask, putting on shades, putting on a cap. You tell me that's Miles Taylor. You tell, you tell me that that's him. You can't. It's not. It's just a guy. So there's benefits to wearing a mask, even if you don't want to. You know, a lot of people who don't want to wear masks are really worried about their protection and their safety yeah do that no one knows who you are I've, I've i've never seen you know you're you're like the carrot top of homeland security with all the props that you <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> you know if, if i could leave with one accolade from the trump administration i guess it would be that right <laughs> well so i i want i don't know how much time uh, you have left but I, I do have some more questions and we appreciate all Please. the time that you're giving us um you had mentioned um sarah sanders uh how she kind of told them you would lose this, this state, this state, if you don't handle something a certain way. Um, so it led me to, to wonder, firstly, is it is it her trying to do good by, by changing the narrative for him? Um, but more importantly, like, who are the people who that you found that knew these things and just would enable it further? I mean, I have to yeah. think that a job like Sarah's uh, and yeah. Kaylee's and Sean's, you know, I, it's got to be the hardest job in the world to, to go. I don't respect the way that they handle it, but let's just put that aside for a minute. It has to be one of the hardest jobs in the world to have to come out and defend his actions daily. Um, it has to be. And that's, I think, a reason why they stopped doing the, the briefings, because what do you say at one point or another? I mean, there's nothing left to say, and they would just get called out for lying anyway. And so, all the tweets coming out. Right. Like you'd say something. Even Saturday Night Live did a skit with Kellyanne Conway where, you know, well, one minute, uh, you know, she's having a good day and then her phone buzzes and she's like, oh, and she has to go deal with it. So I always wondered. And by the way, I thought Kellyanne might have been the writer of the op ed, but I was way wrong. Maybe I was just being so, helpful. you know, I, I think George at the time said something like, I wish it had been. Uh, and he's <laughs> right. become a, a, a friend and a confidant and a, she's just a great person. So. Yeah. Um, so, so, you know, I, I would like to know, like, did you, who are the people that to our perception were, were ride or die with him, but yeah. weren't at, weren't maybe as maybe we're, we're doing what you were doing and trying to steer the narrative to keep people safe. Were there any, are they all just ride or die? And that's where it's very at. few. I mean, here's what I would say is, uh, I'll, I'll avoid walking through a blacklist because when I went into this process, I said very publicly, my targets are the president and to a lesser extent, the vice president of the United States, the two people who are on the ballot, I want them to not win reelection. And in the book, I deliberately avoid 
singling out people. There are people who I could just excoriate for being Trump defenders who also in private over drinks would say, yeah, I think he's a lunatic. And my response would be, then why go out and so fervently enable him? Um, so there's a lot of those folks. But the easy um, atlas to finding them is this. You know them when you see them. The people who you reflexively think were the Trump enablers were, guess what, in private, also the Trump enablers. Yeah. If they were Trump enablers on TV, actively, regularly, they were Trump enablers in private. In private, they really weren't people who tried to steer in the right direction. That was 90% of the time the case. The people who didn't go out very much to defend him personally, especially in the first half of his presidency, you know, those cabinet secretaries, some of which I mentioned earlier, that axis of adults, you really didn't see them out there much. You didn't see Jim Mattis, Secretary of Defense, saying Donald Trump is right. He's the best. He's the greatest. In fact, in cabinet meetings, when he would go around and beg people to demonstrate fealty, people like Jim Mattis and John Kelly would say, Mr. President, you know, thank you for the opportunity to serve. I want to applaud my workforce for being good at what they do. Whereas other cabinet secretaries would say, I want to applaud you yeah, for being right. so great. Go back to that first cabinet meeting and watch that yeah, video. Yeah, I remember Rex Tillerson as well. Oh, is that the there one that a, was like the stage where they were all going around the room one at a time? They went around and, and the, you know, so many of them just said how much they loved Trump. And that. a few of them, you know, talked about, didn't even say anything like that and wouldn't. So people really revealed themselves actually very publicly and made it obvious whether they were enablers or not during the Trump administration. And I think... Um, that's actually good because they've put the the scarlet letter on themselves rather than someone else doing it for them. Yeah. The, so the two other things that I, I would love to know about and I've always wondered about. Um, firstly, um, Jared Kushner's involvement. I mean, especially since we're talking about the security department, um, yeah. you know, infamously, uh, he did not even clear um, to get credentials um, at all. But yet it was it was forced through. Um, and then it also, on top of that, you have him literally going to the Middle East and all of these different countries representing us. Um, are those those things happen and your department's not even aware of what's going on? Are you in the loop and know, OK, Jaro's going there, he's going to try to do this? Or is it really just are they just doing what they want and you're finding out when everybody else does? Uh, the the latter. So. This is a cautionary tale for students of government or democracy or just citizens that care about whether their vote matters. It's a cautionary tale because it should never happen again. In places like the Trump administration, which is now hopefully a relic on the ash heap of history, but in places like that, yes, you have people who are not assigned to run certain departments or agencies making decisions for those departments or agencies um, unbeknownst to those leaders that have extraordinary impacts on the American people and making those decisions in the dark of night and uh, to the ignorance of the people who are actually responsible for running those departments and agencies. What's the end result of that? Well, the end result of that is often it makes the country less safe. If there's people in the White House who are making national security decisions and the people who run those agencies don't know about them, it creates vulnerability. Vulnerability that if our adversaries knew about it, and in many cases I have to assume they did because of their attempts to collect intelligence on us, uh, they can take advantage of it and they can hurt us and they can do things over the course of years beyond that administration to hurt us and, and to divide us. So that's a big problem, yes. But I will say one thing that's sort of controversial and some of my even some of my fellow critics of Donald Trump will disagree with. I actually found that Jared, while he often second guessed cabinet secretaries, while he often did their jobs, while he often played the role of director of national intelligence, attorney general, secretary of state, secretary of homeland security when he shouldn't have he was actually one of the more rational voices in the West Wing of the White House who was willing to stand up to the president when so many more accomplished, older, and more seasoned people would lose their shit in front of the president 
and back down and cower. And, and so Governor Jared's, Cuomo said the same thing in his book that yeah, he told I mean, that he totally. Was- like Jared's not a hero by any measure, but at the same time, I have to, I got to call the balls and strikes. Like the people who hate Trump just want to believe that Jared and Ivanka were these devils that were as bad as Trump. I got to be real with you. Jared and Ivanka ended up oftentimes being a lifeline who were like, we get it. It's so screwed up. We're going to do our best to fix it. And they would be the last line of defense. And Maybe 50% of the time they wouldn't succeed, but 50% of the time that the public doesn't know about, a Jared or Ivanka went in and was like, sir, you can't do this. And he would back down and give us enough time to do the right thing. I have to give them credit for that. So as much as I question a lot of the things they've done, like life is not black and white, it's shades of gray. And Jared and Ivanka are somewhere in those shades of gray. And they did actually some good things because they realized that their dad was insane. (laughs) Yeah, but you know, that's actually one of the early thoughts when he first got in and they were in there. It's like, okay, you know what? Look, we, we're not crazy about Ivanka, but maybe she can keep him reined in because, you know, he, he does li- listen to her. So, you know, that that's good to hear. And, and no matter what an opinion is of f- our opinions from the outside or from the press, I'm not going to turn around and be like, oh, well, I, I disagree. I think I, I'm not there. And, and it's good to know that. It's good to know that they're... Were kind of, times, but I, you know? I mean, I'll contradict you, Rob, because I'll say, though, at the same time, we should never end up in a situation <laughs> right, right where door, Miles, Taylor, t- Miles Taylor, DHS chief of staff, has to depend <laughs> on the president's son-in-law <laughs> to throw himself on the train tracks at the last minute and be like, please stop, this is a terrible decision. Like, we should never, I, I don't want to count on Hunter Biden. <laughs> or Hunter Biden's wife right. to stop Joe Biden at the last minute <laughs> in like a Jack Bauer 24 scenario from doing a bad thing. I don't want to count on that. Yeah. And I'm so grateful. I literally slept better last night knowing that I didn't have to wake up and check Twitter and the news for some urgent insanity because I don't think Hunter Biden's wife has to wake up and throw herself on the train tracks to stop Joe Biden from making dumb decisions. So we are lucky and we should relish this moment because democracy survived the past four years and uh, it's always a generation away from extinction, but uh, we, we made it and, and we got to learn the lessons from this. We can't forget. We got to have accountability and transparency and hopefully that allows us to reach our 300th birthday. America's not 300 years old yet, but Jesus Christ, let's just hope that we can reach our 300th birthday and then we'll at least have done our part as a generation. Absolutely. Look, I, I, I can't thank you enough for joining us. It's, you know, you had mentioned before we started that, uh, you know, uh, you see people's personalities on our show and, and, and I feel that we've seen yours, you know, I don't, I only get you on, on like 10 minute blips here and there and, you know, you're answering the questions and that's that, but you know, you, you can see how much you care about, what you did and 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 you know you can it wasn't a money grab like some people might have accused you of or it wasn't about anything other than the fact that you love the country and you were you're afraid for it um and i and i get that sense even even more now than beforehand so you know i i want to thank you for for what you did and i i think all of the little pieces all contributed in their own way i think your book did i think your op-ed did I think, you know, other books had, you know, played a part in it. I think other people who have spoken out played a part. Little by little by little, it eroded the the support away from, forget the base, but from everyone else who was kind of on the fence or, you know, we, you know we've heard it all the time. Oh, my 401k is doing good, so whatever. You know what I mean? Like, though, there are a lot of people like that. I've worked with a lot of people like that. Mm-hmm. And, and many of them towards the end, it's crazy, I'm going to say this, but in a weird way, the capital insurrection almost had to happen yes. because the world needed to see that ugliness up front. And it's crazy the difference between day one and day five when the videos really started coming out. Because in day one, it looked like they all just walked in, took a couple of pictures, smiled, left, and that's that because you couldn't really see from a distance. As the video started coming out, and people were horrified. You know, these people. And you like, hear them screaming for Mike Pence and for Nancy Pelosi, like right. screaming to get right. them. It's definitely yeah. the best thing ever politically that could happen for Mike Pence. I'll tell you that. Yeah, I mean, but you know, it's just the fact that you know he. 
I they they said that they spoke afterwards and and the 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 they said afterwards that they discussed election fraud. There's no way. I guarantee you Mike Pence went in there and said, I'm never going to talk to you again. Like, you're done to me. Like, he, he had to. When you put somebody's family on the line, unless you're Ted Cruz, if you put someone's family on the line, you know, I got to think that that's a moment. And I don't want to, you know, turn Mike Pence into a hero because when you enable somebody for three years and 11 months, you don't get yeah. credit for the last two yeah. weeks. That's um, so true. But, you know, it's amazing how many people have all of a sudden been emboldened the moment he was impending his way. The way out was on the way. And all of a sudden, Mitch McConnell became a patriot once he lost Georgia. The next day, he was all about the president. You know, we all see through it. But I think it was important for the world to see that element and not just see them at rallies holding signs, but to see what they were capable of. And you're going to get, you know, you get the the comparisons. People go, you know, oh, Black Lives Matter and Antifa and all, and all this stuff. So, you know, no violence is good, period. But this was the first time that you saw that words and the irresponsibility of what you say, especially when you lie to the people who are supposed to trust you, it shows what it can do. I don't know if it's going to make a difference. I know it won't with the base. I know the, the QAnon crews, they're, they're just on another planet altogether, and I don't think that's going to change. But but you don't need, you know, just the base will never get him back in. Um, you know, and I, I the, the, look, Junior could probably run. Who knows? But maybe after a couple of years, the, the world will see, hey, it's so nice not to give a shit about what the president did for three we- three months. You know, like, wake me up when there's a war or you're going to take care of something. Yeah. But other than that, just I don't want to know about you instead of every day, all day long. It's, so, time, it's, it's time to, as I always say, it's time to make politics boring again. Let's just, <laughs> let's just get to a period where, like, we don't have to think about the president on a daily basis. Like, then this is how I, this is why I would criticize fellow conservatives who loved Trump, is I would say, look, we are for limited government. And people can disagree with that. There's people, obviously, on the other side of the aisle from me who want government to be much more involved because they think government can correct inequities and injustice. And I'm much more skeptical of, of government's ability to do that because I think government breaks more China on the way to doing that. They, it does more damage uh, in, in trying to do that. But that said, when I would talk to fellow conservatives who love Trump, at the end of the day, my conversation would be, look, we're both limited government conservatives. Donald Trump is literally so pervasively in our lives that he's invaded our heads every single day. <laughs> That's not just big government. That's the biggest government we've ever had that's inside our brains all day, every day. He's an awful, you know, big government leader. And, like, that's why I felt like it was so hypocritical that conservatives, uh, you know, ran to him or, or, or cowered before him. We could go on about that for days. But, Rob, the last thing, I want to I align with you about what you said on the Capitol insurrection. I'm, I'm accused of being a chronic Mr. Brightside. But I had to find the bright side in that event. Mm. And the bright side was exactly as you said, was the people who had not yet had the wake up call, who so desperately needed the wake up call, whether it was disingenuous or real, uh, came out after that and said, this is unacceptable. And it came four years too late, but it had to happen. And there's almost nothing better that could have happened to shock the country into burying Trumpism six feet underground than to have that citadel of democracy stormed by domestic terrorists. And I would have never wanted that to happen again. I wouldn't wish that upon us as a country, but that it did will help us put the epitaph on Trumpism and write a eulogy for the Donald Trump era in American politics. And I hope that those words end up being uh, true years from now. So we'll see. Yeah. And I also hope you have a, you have any aspiration for politics in the future? Oh man. What I'm doing right now is you guys saw I'm wearing swim trunks <laughs> and, a, and a polo. I, I, I left town for the inauguration cause I would have gone cause I would have been, it would have been the thrill of my life to see Joe Biden inaugurated, but the security situation was such that I came 
uh, came down south uh, to just because uh, they just knew you had your pen on you, probably, yeah, probably. <laughs> and any number of other things, and so in a different location than I would normally be, whatever else. But uh, no, would have loved to have seen it. And um, but you know, politics. I'm going to take a break from that for a while. And honestly, I hope that that the rest of the country does too. I hope we all get to take a break, and we care about the things that we should care about. But honestly. We should all, whether or not we are Democrat or Republican, we should try to support our commander in chief where we can and not question his motives. Debate his policies, but don't question his motives because uh, this man's got good motives. And I say that as a Republican and I, I worked with Joe Biden on Capitol Hill in his office and uh, he's a good man who's going to try to do right for the country. I'm going to disagree with him on issues, but hopefully we all get to move on with our lives. Pay attention to your children. Go to the park. Walk your dog. Uh, don't yeah. don't let this thing dominate your life. So that's where I hope we end up. And for me, that's going to mean spending a good bit of time outside of the political arena. Awesome. Well, if you ever decide to get back in, I think uh, your voice and, and your intelligence – play a major part we can use a lot more intelligence in politics no that rob <laughs> didn't say face he said, well, <laughs> well, that kind of well, my first job was in radio and uh, they said i got the face for radio so he was like yeah you got a good you got a good voice oh, it'll be oh, fine please. <laughs> but I, I'm, I'm reading your backstory i'm like how did he work in the bush administration like he has an age he's like the benjamin buttons of, <laughs> of government uh, yeah yeah, yeah. That's so, all, so i'll be a baby by the time i run for something just, you know, well then you you're perfect. That is perfect for government. <laughs> well, uh, Miles, hang on one second. I just want to wrap this up, but I want to talk to you for a second afterwards. Uh, I want everyone, again, please, you, you should check out the book, A Warning by Anonymous, which we now know is Miles. I went the audio book route. Uh, it's not Miles reading it, so it's it's a little uh, strange he hearing that. But, yeah, it's, yeah, it's just some guy. Like you It know, sounds but, like an anonymous what anonymous right. would an say. Anonymous guy. Fine. you guys no one knows that that's what they did is our my publisher called me and they said you know because we don't want people to know if it's a guy or a gal so we had the uh we, we flipped a coin on whether it would be a male or a female that read the book so it was a wonderful gentleman who was yeah. kind enough to do it but who's got a better voice than me so yeah. apologies <laughs> for those of you who hung on for an hour uh i won't i won't great you uh in the audiobook he you did. could have had a siri do it if yeah. <laughs> now that would be 21st century <laughs> well miles thank you again and, and and once again please check out the book um you can uh file follow miles taylor on twitter at miles taylor usa i follow you miles there's some great stuff on there we're, we're gonna um, when this episode comes out, I'll definitely uh, share this with you as well. Um, but you know, if you if you like this episode and you, and you like what it, what Miles had to say, you should check out the book and and definitely follow him on Twitter because he, you know, it's it's rare to have people that uh, have that kind of integrity uh, in Washington to put their life on the line, which you did. So we appreciate that, Miles. Thank you very much, and thank you for listening to the whole. I am Rob Sprance. I'm Lori Levine.